Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And I would like to welcome you to this class on analog circuits for music synthesis. We've focused on weird, complicated, folding nonlinearities created by Don Buchla. He created these crazy zigzagging nonlinearities by taking a set of circuits that created dead bands, run them in parallel, and then alternately add and subtract the resulting outputs, where each of the dead bands had the edges of the dead band at a different spot, and these slopes were varied in order to be able to create this nonlinearity. In this lecture, I'm going to show you a way to create this sort of nonlinearity with these kinds of zigzags, but in a very different way. Whereas Buchla called this timbre generation, Serge referred to these circuits as wave multipliers. The Serge synthesizer sort of grew up in the same overall ecosystem as the Buchla synthesizers. And essentially, Serge was responding for the desire of synthesizers that were cheaper than the Buchlas. And he ran something of a clandestine manufacturing operation at CalArts and came up with some really cool designs. Serge synthesizers are four rack units high, and a rack unit is 1.75 inches. So that would make that seven inches high. The Buchla systems are also four rack units high. Serge uses banana jacks for everything, whereas Buchla used banana jacks for control signals and eighth inch jacks for audio signals. Although they're not really eighth inch jacks, they're really something called tinny jacks or tiny jacks. They're slightly bigger than your standard eighth inch jack that you're probably used to for headphones and your rack systems. So Eurorack systems and Frackrack systems, like the Paya modules and the Bugbrand modules and the Blasset modules, and those all tend to use 8th inch, aka 3.5 millimeter jacks. And then there's the 5U standard, so those are 8.75 inches high compared to Eurorack, which is just 5.25 inches high. 5U modules generally take advantage of that larger size to use quarter inch jacks of the sort that guitar players might be used to versus the smaller eighth inch jacks on Euro rack systems. One nice thing about the banana plugs is that you can stack them on outputs. Now you don't want to stack inputs, but it's easy to take a banana plug and then stick another banana plug on it and stick another banana plug on it and run an output to multiple places without having to have what's called a multiple, which is just a bunch of eighth inch or quarter inch jacks in a row that are connected to each other. Another interesting thing about Serge is that you would typically buy these as a full panel. So if you wanted to swap, say, the wave multipliers and the variable Q voltage controlled filter around here, you couldn't do that. You're sort of stuck with whatever series of modules you had ordered. But there are some manufacturing advantages of doing a whole panel at once like this. So Serge's version of this kind of wave folding circuit appeared in a module called the wave multipliers. And the Wave Multipliers module actually had several different kinds of multipliers. So I'm just going to show you one in this particular lecture. Now, a slight difference in philosophy is that Buchla would take his timbre circuitry and internally hardwire its input to the sine wave output of his oscillators. In the Serge paradigm, you can just kind of stick whatever kind of waveform in here you want. And it could be a sinusoid, or it could be a sawtooth, or it could be a triangle, or it could be your voice, or any number of crazy things. Something interesting about the early surges is they usually had paper face plates, so people will talk about paper face surges. And so to make manufacturing simple, they would just make a bunch of standard panels that had pre-drilled holes, and they would try to space their controls and their jacks in order to match up with those holes. And if a particular module didn't need a hole, the paper would just cover it up. Later surges tended to be nicer and have this nice printing on an aluminum panel. And some very early paper face surges didn't really have standard writing on them at all in some cases. They would just have weird symbols, I guess, to promote creativity or something. Since the wave multiplier was usually used in conjunction with the output of an oscillator, you would often find modules that would have an oscillator, like here, the new timbral oscillator, sitting next to the wave multiplier. Whereas in a Buchla module like the 259, all of this would be incorporated in one module. So how did Serge create one of these crazy nonlinearities? 
Oh, and I should mention that I believe these were developed independently. You shouldn't think of it like Serge trying to copy a Bukla design or vice versa, although Serge was very much part of the Bukla school of thinking about synthesizers. I just happened to cover the designs in this particular order. I could have started with the Serge wave folder and then covered the Bukla timbre generating circuit. Anyway, instead of having a bunch of circuits in parallel, basically Serge has a simple folding building block, and then he runs these in series. So one of the stages of the Serge wave multiplier, as we saw before, if you were to put in a signal that stayed within this range, you would get the same signal out because you're staying in this linear range. But when you hit the edge here, he designs the circuit to fold in on itself like this. And so if you wanted to make a zigzaggy pattern that went up like this, well, all you would have to do is pass this through an identical stage. So if the output of one of these starts to go negative past this threshold, well, that would be equivalent to being at this input in the next stage and it would fold over. And similarly, if the output of the first stage started to go positive like this, then the input of the second stage would correspond to this point and it would again fold over and start going the other direction. So taking one of these stages and cascading another adds another couple of teeth to this waveform, and then you can keep piling these together. Serge used six. Now in 2020, the best place to learn about Serge designs is actually to look at the work of Ken Stone, who in addition to developing a huge number of amazing original circuits, very much carry the torch of the Serge design philosophy. And so here's his updated version of the wave multiplier. And you can see one of the wave folding stages here. And I'll go into detail later on how this works. So here's one stage, here's two stages, here's three stages. The plot here goes off the edge and onto the next slide, comes down through here. And then here's stage four, five, and six. And here he's put a 330 ohm output impedance just as a bit of short circuit protection. Oh, this is kind of interesting. And this is something I've seen before. Notice he takes the output that he's feeding back here through that 330 ohm resistor instead of having the feedback loop connect through like here and not having this here. I think it doesn't really make much difference one way or another. As usual, we're going to ignore the capacitors. These are just here for stability if needed. And remember, in the Buchla circuit, he basically put a voltage-controlled amplifier in front, and by changing the gain of that amplifier, you could change the number of teeth in that nonlinearity you would hit. And Serge does the same thing here. Buchla designed a simple VCA using a JFET as a voltage-controlled resistance, whereas Serge used an OTA to build exactly the kind of voltage-controlled amplifier we looked at much earlier in the class. So... How does one of these stages work? So let's call the input Vn, and let's call the output Vout, as usual. And let's for a second assume that these diodes to ground aren't there. So in this case, we'll have no current flowing through this 33K resistor because there's no current flowing into the positive terminal of the op amp. Using superposition, we'll see that the output is a combination of two things the resistor in the feedback loop and the resistor going to the negative terminal form an inverting stage that just gives me a minus Vn. And then Vn being copied to the positive terminal, well, that's going to act as a non-inverting stage. So that's going to be like 1 plus the feedback resistance over this 100K resistance. So that's going to give me a plus 2 Vn, and that's all going to add up basically to say that V out is going to equal V in. But that's for the particular case where we're ignoring those diodes. And that's okay to do as long as V in is in a certain approximate range. And we'll say it's something like maybe it's four V in between the diode drops provided by these diodes, basically the turn-on voltages of the diodes. So maybe that's something like 0.6 or 0.65, or maybe it's something like 0.7. I'll go ahead and write a minus 0.7 here. I should have left a little more space before the 4. Let's actually erase that and let it make a little more space. 
So let's write the minus 0.7 volts over here, and we'll say it's for this particular range. I have a new computer and haven't hooked up the drivers for the graphics tablet yet, so that's why this is a little messy looking. Anyway, once the voltage hits that kind of level, these diodes will start conducting and they'll clamp the voltage at that particular point. So the net effect is that as long as you're in this region, well, the output is just going to equal the input. But beyond that, the voltage at the positive terminal is going to clamp and then the inverting stage takes precedent. So the positive input is held constant and this starts to drop down the other direction and you'll get something similar on the other side. Now, this notion of a 0.7 volt diode drop or whatever, that's not real. That's just a convenient rule of thumb for reasonable currents that most circuits that use diodes work at. The current voltage characteristic of a diode is exponential in nature, and this is just a rule of thumb. So it's not like the nonlinearity has this perfect triangular shape here. It's going to actually be rounded out a little bit because this diode doesn't instantly turn on or instantly turn off going the other direction. And as an aside, this structure with this resistor and the two back-to-back -back diodes to ground, that's extremely common in guitar distortion pedals. Things like the Boss DS1, things like the Proco Rat, and even fancy distortion pedals like the Klon Centaur all will use this kind of structure. Nowadays, these are usually silicon diodes, but something like the Klon Centaur will use germanium diodes that have a turn-on voltage of more like around 0.3 volts than 0.7 volts. Guitar pedals that have back-to-back -back diodes in the feedback loop of an op amp, those are typically called overdrive pedals. So that's things like the Ibanez Tube Screamer or the Marshall Blues Breaker pedal. So if you would like to build your own wave multiplier or other surge circuit, I would recommend going to LB Designs and click on For You Cat Girl Synth Surge Modules. So LB Designs took over the sale of Ken Stone's PCBs, both his own original designs and ones based on surge circuitry. So let me look up multiplier, more details. Oh, updated design. There's a newer version probably than what I showed you. So let's go to the updated design. Ah, there you go. Now, the kind of wave folding nonlinearity I've showed you is often called the middle wave multiplier in the original shared circuit. There were two other weird waveform distorting thingies in that circuit as well that are also fun, but I won't go through those in this lecture series. Maybe after the class is over, I'll do a bonus lecture or two where we could analyze those circuits if there's sufficient interest. I haven't actually looked at those circuits myself yet, but they might be fun to analyze. Anyway, I've been showing you the middle wave multiplier, which, oh, I think in this drawing would correspond to this thing in the upper left. They changed the layout around a bit compared to the original Serge. So here's a build guide for it. That's pretty cool. Um, where can you actually buy it? Where's the buy link? Description. Oh, maybe when you order the 113, you get this 513. If you did place an order, you would want to double check with them about what you're getting. So you can either order the board or you can pay a bit more and get the board with a bunch of components. Also, you can get the same circuits in a setup designed for your rack modules. So these are probably reformatted a bit. Anyway, there's also another company called Random Source that is keeping the Serge magic alive. Serge wave multipliers. Let's see, 750 euro at a cart. Um, no, let's not add a cart. Oh, can you just buy the front panel if you wanted to do do it yourself? I don't know. It looks like they want to sell you full systems. If you like the front panels, maybe you could contact them and see if they'll just sell you the panel if you want to do some DIY. I'm not sure. You could probably drop them an email and ask.